morning, everybody. I'm Jeff Liepenson, president of the IAEL. Welcome to the IAEL general meetings um, and the IAEL Meetem Legal Summit. This is the 50th Meetem, and it's the 42nd birth of the um, IAEL here at Meetem. Uh, a little business, just little business items, just to orient you for the rest of the day. Uh, we're going to at noon uh, feature our master class on visual social media, friend, foe, or frenemy. Uh, at 2.30, we're presenting our new IAEL book. We do a new book every year. This year's book is Monetization of the Global Music Industry, From Creators to Major Industry. And if anyone has a proposal for next year's book, uh, please speak with me or with Duncan or Lee or Marcel outside. Um, it's a great project to be a part of. At 4.30 this afternoon, right outside this room, we'll be having our IAEL cocktails. Good chance to get to meet all your colleagues in the organization. And this evening at 7.30 at Plage Royale, right down the beach, we'll have our IAEL members dinner, uh, which is always a great time. Um, if you haven't RSVP'd for the dinner, just speak to someone at the desk and, and we'll get you on the list. Uh, tomorrow morning we have our Meet the Lawyers session at 10.30 and then our annual general meeting at 11.30. Uh, that, and everyone's invited to the AGM. That's where we discuss the future plans for the IAEL and next year's book uh, and other matters. So you're all welcomed and encouraged to come. Um, but first today, we're going to begin with our IAEL legal update. This is one of our core presentations over the years where we discuss the emerging trends in entertainment uh, law around the world. Um, leading the legal update as he has for many years is Alexander Ross. Alex is a member of the IAEL Legal Committee. He's a partner at Wigan in London and a head, the head of their commercial music and digital publishing groups. Um, and Alexander has done this now for 14 years. And uh, he's advised us that this will be his last time. Uh, we hope that even though if he's not going to be leading the update, that he'll participate maybe on the panel or in some other way, but you've been a, a major contributor to the IAEL over the years. So for now, I'd like to give you that brief thank you. And it's my pleasure to introduce you again to Alexander Ross. Jeff, thank you very much indeed. I'm afraid I'm going to be sitting down. Do forgive me if you can't see at the back, but it's not really worth it anyway. Um, now, the session is really divided into two halves. And for our first half, we have our panel of speakers here who are going to give us um, updates from various jurisdictions but including also an update from my partner and colleague in Brussels, Ted Shapiro, who will kick us off. Ted will be largely talking about where we are with the digital single market in Europe, um, what we should expect uh, to come from the Commission in the future. We then have John McClellan from Haldanes in Hong Kong, who will be talking about what's going on in the Far East, both Hong Kong and China. Gordon Williams from Leon Thompson in the UK, uh, will give us the UK update. Peter Marks from Marks, I always forget the name of your firm, Peter, I'm very sorry, because it's a very long one. It's a very long one. Would Marks you like from Rands for me and Barbers. Beautifully done. <laughs> who will be giving us an update from Belgium. And then Florian Hensel, um, who I welcome to the panel, first time on the panel, first time at Medem, uh, from SKW Schwartz in Germany. And then I'm in the second half, I'm, we're very, very pleased to have with us um, three new keynote speakers. Uh, we have Graham Henderson, who is the president of Music Canada. We have David Alsaye, who is the secretary general of SASEM. And we also have Tim Cohen, who is the senior vice president legal and business affairs of Peer Music in the United States. And in that second half, we're going to focus on the collective rights management directive and what the fallout and effect of that's likely to be, and also, quite obviously, the value gap, the big one. So, you don't want to hear any more from me. Let's kick off with our first speaker, Ted. I'd like to take us through what's been happening in Brussels. Okay, okay thank you very much, Alexander. And um, 
Good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk a little bit about developments at the European level um, and the so-called digital single market, um, which is an effort by the European Commission to create a seamless digital single market where goods, persons, services, and capital can flow smoothly, and more importantly, where citizens and businesses can access online services uh, under conditions of fair competition and irrespective of their nationality or place of residence. And this is a big point for the European Commission and the DSM, the territoriality of copyright, which has been particularly problematic on the audiovisual sector, but I think a little bit less so on the music side, although that's not to say that territoriality isn't important there and, and for that matter, for other sectors. Um, this all flows from a strategy that was adopted in May 2015. Um, we had some first indications of what was coming in December 2015 when they uh, launched a proposed regulation on portability. Uh, portability is also an attack, if you will, on territoriality, but it is about being able to take a service that you have signed up to at home and access it when you travel around the European Union. Um, the member states have largely now agreed this text, but the European Parliament, after fighting over who was going to get to be in charge of it, has only just got underway. But we expect that this will probably be finished, this piece of legislation. It is a regulation, not a directive, which is the usual um, vehicle, legislative vehicle for legislation in the EU. A regulation is immediately binding on the member states of the European Union. That should be, should be done by the beginning of next year. Um, but there is more on the way, a second wave of copyright legislation looking at more issues of territoriality and the flip side of portability, which is cross-border access. Uh, exceptions, there may be a new exception coming, for example, for text and data mining. Um, the role of platforms is being discussed in this uh, whole swirl. The value gap, which I'll talk about a little bit more author and performer remuneration, and further down the road, perhaps some more stuff on enforcement. Another raft of legislation in separate areas, including on geo-filtering. The European Commission hates geo-filtering, a proposed regulation um, that excludes copyright, but copyright is not being spared, um, came out on the 25th. And as I said, we expect to see more copyright legislation, and it's supposed to come this fall, I still find it hard to believe that they are going to put out a directive on a whole range of areas of copyright this fall, but indeed, internally in the Commission, they are debating something called an impact assessment, which is a necessary precursor to legislation at the European level, and once they agree what is in that impact assessment, they have largely agreed internally the main lines of the legislation, not the actual wording of it, but their preferred approaches um, and that is meant to be approved this summer. They're fighting over it uh, probably as I speak. Um, one of the areas that they're going to uh, discuss and legislate on, a, a bit less important for the, uh, for the music industry, but nevertheless, I think it's interesting to see um, the next step in this attack on copyright territoriality they would like to take elements of a directive from 1993 and extend it to the internet. Mandatory retransmission, mandatory collective management for new forms of retransmission, uh, maybe over the internet, they're still arguing about that, and also to extend the so-called country of origin principle that applies for communication to the public by satellite to the making available of online broadcast services, their ancillary services such as catch-up and simulcast, maybe further, all still being fought about. Um, and also perhaps wrestling with uh, a new doctrine from the Court of Justice on direct injection, which is sort of killing the whole retransmission um, uh, field. I see someone shaking their head in the front row. There's a big fight about whether or not the Court of Justice got this right. Um, uh, particularly if you were used to collecting retransmission royalties and um, there's an argument that they're not available anymore. Uh, so I'm going to focus a little bit more on a bigger issue for the music industry and that is called the value gap. 
The European Commission has said that they are going to legislate on this this fall. Um, and the music sector has done an incredible job over the last couple of years of getting this issue onto the agenda. Um, it, it never ceases to amaze me how if you keep at something and keep on saying how important it is, you can maintain it and get it on the agenda. Just recently, Francis Moore, who is the head of the IFPI, in a speech, I believe, in Canada, gave a good definition of what the value gap is. Some call it the, um, there are various other names for it, but basically the value gap, she says, is something that business can't fix. We need legislation. It's a legislative issue that is caused by the so-called safe harbors, the liability privileges in the e-commerce directive in the European Union. Very similar things in the DMCA um, from 1998 in the US. The safe harbors for certain online services allow them to say, we're not responsible. So if you want to license them, and they're willing to take a license, and you don't like the fee that they are proposing, they can turn around to you and say, well, send us a notice. We'll take it down. Of course, notice and takedown is not a uh, leverage for commercial negotiation. And this is causing a serious problem for the music industry. Whoops. Uh, as I said, mostly this is about services that can hide out in Article 14 of the e-commerce directive, the hosting privilege. This was something that was adopted in 2000, directive from 2000. I always say it was done about five minutes before peer-to-peer -peer, uh, launched. Um, it is a provision that was not designed to deal with Web 2.0. That is for sure, but the courts have adapted it and mostly adapted it in a way that goes against um, much of what the music industry has been espousing. So how do you fix it? Well, normally, you could fix Article 14. That would deal with it. Um, there seems to be zero political will to touch Article 14. So maybe you just give it a kick in the pants via the copyright directive, and in particular, you focus on Article 3, the communication to the public and, uh, and making available right. And you clarify that these platforms, what they are doing, are, is communicating to the public. There, are, there is case law at the Court of Justice in the eBay and Google France cases that says that when a platform is not neutral to the content, it should not be able to hide out in the safe harbor. It seems like most of the national courts haven't gotten that memo. Um, at the same time, the Court of Justice, in a line of case law, has been undermining the communication to the public and the making available rights, so crucial to how all online services operate and so crucial to enforcement. Um, and so there's a, uh, a question about right now before the Court of Justice as to whether linking to infringing content is communication to the public. Um, the French have been looking at this issue. Uh, some have asked whether there's a third way to deal with it in a separate instrument. And what about other value gaps? The publishers say they need a related right. Authors and performers are demanding uh, statutory rights of remuneration for making available. So all this swirling around. So what is at stake? Well, value gap is killing music. Uh, the platforms, they say, if you do this, you'll break the internet. You'll end democracy. You'll stifle free speech. Wow, you might even get the EU de-indexed. Um, <laughs> there are also questions, though, about fooling around with the making available right. Is that uh, dangerous? Will we instead create more new remuneration rights subject to mandatory collective rights administration? More levies online? Um, will we do something to the territoriality of exclusive rights? More country of origin along the lines that I explained before? Uh, will there be other concessions that have to be made? I already mentioned um, perhaps also having to deal with the Court of Justice's war on linking. As I, as I mentioned before, at the moment, the Commission is trying to figure out how to bridge this value gap, and we expect to see some kind of proposal emerge in the fall. And so I think my time is probably up. So with that, I will just wish you all peace, love, and copyright. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ted. Lots of questions, not many answers, but of course we hope we'll get answers by the fall. 
if that happens. But maybe this time next year, we'll be discussing what those proposals are. Right, now let's move swiftly on to our country updates. And gentlemen, we have, I've given you a short time. If I start waving my pad around, that's because you're running out of time, okay. I'm afraid I'll have to keep you strictly to eight minutes each. First up, Gordon uh, Williams from the UK. Tell us what's been going on in the United Kingdom recently. Uh, so 2015 was another excellent year for UK recorded music, uh, which achieved a best ever 17% global market share. One of every six albums sold, and half of the best selling, the top 10 best selling albums worldwide were by British groups, with Adele leading the way at number one. Uh, the number of audio streams increased 82% to 27 billion plays, delivering a 69% uh, rise in income to 146 million pounds. But contrast that with the pitiful 0.4% increase to 24 million pounds from the likes of YouTube and other ad-funded video streamers, despite an even greater rise in plays of 88%, and then take on board the equally staggering statistic that the niche vinyl market, which represents just less than 2% of music consumption, generates more revenue than ad-funded video streams, which represent almost 20% of music consumption. And you will understand that the UK is a prime illustration of the value gap in action. That hot topic for debate, which we've heard some and we'll hear some more later. Uh, what this means is that despite the increased sales activity and the record global market share, in value terms, recorded music sales dropped by about 1% to 688 million. Uh, meanwhile, the live music market in the UK continues to go from strength to strength and to outpace the recorded music market by some distance. Umbrella Trade Body UK Music's latest published research, which relates to 2014, shows live music revenues of 924 million compared to 615 million for recorded music and 410 million for music publishing. Uh, on the statute books, we had an amendment to our Copyright Act overturned by the courts. Uh, this was the government's attempt to enact an exception for private copying and to remove the anomaly that consumers making private copies of recordings they'd purchased or transferring them between devices were thereby infringing copyright. Uh, unlike many of its European counterparts, however, the, European, the UK government did not see fit to impose a blank media levy to compensate rights holders for this exception. Uh, this led to UK Music, the Musicians' Union, and the British Academy of Songwriters, Composers, and Authors suing the government for failing to provide fair compensation for rights holders in contravention of Article 5.2 of the EU Copyright Directive. Now, judgment was handed down shortly after MEDEM last year, uh, with the court deciding that the government's conclusion that minimal harm would be caused by the absence of a levy was based on manifestly inadequate evidence and was flawed. And so our private copying exception was quashed. The court refused to decide whether private copies made during the exception's brief existence were legal or not, uh, which means all you law-abiding UK lawyers out there who waited all those years for the exception before <laughs> uploading your CDs to your mobile devices uh, need to go and uh, delete them all again uh, if you want to be able to sleep at night. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, the anomaly that private copying in the UK is illegal continues. Uh, in the courts, the real action has been in the continuing war between the newspaper industry and privacy claimants, many of them from the world of entertainment, and it's a war in which my firm's been heavily involved. The, the aftershocks of the phone hacking scandal rumble on. Uh, to recap, that scandal came to light through numerous civil claims against Newsgroup, all of which were settled before trial. An ensuing judicial inquiry into press standards led to the establishment of a new regulatory framework, which the newspapers then refused to sign up to, and they set up their own regulator instead. Criminal proceedings were pursued against various newsgroup executives, and the Prime Minister's own former spin doctor, who'd been editor of the News of the World at the time, was found guilty and sentenced to 18 months in prison. Just before Medem last year, uh, we had judgment in the first batch of civil cases against the Mirror Group, which had seen much higher awards of damages than expected. The largest being £260,000 to the actor Sadie Frost, 
with the evidence having shown systematic hacking of victims' phones several times every day over a period of several years, resulting in the publication of numerous stories and the destruction of the victims' relationships with those closest to them, whom they could not but suspect of leaking the information, to the point of Sadie Frost even insisting her own mother sign a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, Mirror Group then appealed to the Court of Appeal, but without success, and they've since been refused permission for a further appeal to the Supreme Court. So I'm pleased to say that the damages awards stand as a precedent for others to follow. Uh, in the meantime, the international news organizations have opened a separate front of hostilities against privacy claimants by seeking to challenge existing UK privacy injunctions on the basis that the claimant's identity is no longer private if it's available on the internet following publication in other jurisdictions. There appears to be a worrying trend of international news organizations engineering publication of the claimant's identity overseas and drawing their UK readers' attention to the availability of that information on the internet and then seeking to overturn the UK privacy injunction on the basis that the information is no longer private, amounting in effect to a deliberate attempt to circumvent the rule of UK law. These issues have been aired most notably in the case of PJS versus News Group. Uh, the anonymized claimant is one of a celebrity couple in the world of entertainment with young children who is seeking to prevent publication of a story that the couple had engaged in sexual activity as part of a threesome. At first instance, the court accepted the private nature of this information and that there was no countervailing public interest so as to justify publication. So an injunction was granted. However, on appeal, the Court of Appeal was convinced that the injunction should be overturned because of News Group's argument that the claimant's identity was available on the internet following its publication in other jurisdictions and hence was no longer sufficiently private. Leave was given for the claimant to appeal to the Supreme Court before the injunction was lifted, and the Supreme Court has just decided that the injunction should be maintained. The lead judgment firmly made the point that celebrities are not public officials, and that in the absence of a misleading public image which should be corrected, there is no public interest in the publication of kiss and tell stories about their sexual encounters, however interesting to the public they may be. As such stories have been the mainstay of the UK tabloid press, I expect there'll be more to come on this issue when we meet again in a year's time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gordon. Florian, over to you. Let's hear about what's hap happening in Germany. Thank you, Alexander. Can we, get Can we have slides for Florian? Thank you. Thank you. Um, when Alexander asked me to, to give an update about uh, Germany and what's happening in Germany and what will um, busy us over the next 12 months, I think um, there's three things that immediately jumped to my mind and which look at this um, value gap from um, other perspectives as well. One is another copyright reform we do in Germany. Um, second one is a very recent Supreme Court decision on collective rights management and how collecting societies can distribute revenues. And the third one is, and that happened only last week, a decision by our constitutional court on how we deal with sampling of recorded music in Germany. So we're doing another copyright reform again, only 15 years after we've done the last one, um, which we put on two pillars. One is we said there is a direct claim for a fair and adequate remuneration against your contractual partners. And US copyright holders have that, and performing artists have that as well. We put a second pillar in place, and that is if it shows that during the exploitation of the work, someone is making a lot of money from that exploitation. And this is not reflected in your original contract with your, um, with your producer or the recording company, then you can ask for the further additional remuneration. These two pillars gave us um, great cases to litigate on over 15 years, and we had lots of negotiations going on. I'm showing you some examples from the film industry. 
And um, oh, sorry, no, it's jumped over some. Need to go back, do it without slides, no problem. Um, now we put some some new um, pieces in place with that new reform. The new reform um, says these two building blocks don't suffice, we need more. We ask whether um, we can do buyout at all anymore, buyout deals at all, whether we should have a remuneration or whether we should have a remuneration that um, is agreed for each type of use. That's one of the new pillars that's discussed. The second one is whether there should be an automated reversion right after five years in licensing contracts. So um, you do a contract, five-year term, 10-year term, and then after five years, if someone else comes up and say, I'll give you better, better percentages, that other um, party can take over that contract. That's currently discussed as part of a reform. And the third piece, and that is extremely burdensome, or could become extremely burdensome from an operational perspective, is a very far-reaching right for um, information um, which is discussed. Um, the original proposal by our government was, um, well, let's do annual reporting by anyone in the exploitation chain to all the rights holders involved in a product, which is quite an interesting proposition, I think. Um, currently, we're looking at a structure that maybe says you, as the copyright holder, have an annual right to ask um, the, um, the exploiters what has been going on exploitation-wise. Um, there's lots of discussions about potential exceptions to that, um, very limited um, input of copyright protected subject matter in a service or product, or whether the gaming industry should be completely excluded um, from this regulation because in, in their mind, um, it doesn't make sense to subject them to that type of, of, um, of legislation at all because they don't have that value gap allegedly in that uh, gaming industry. So that's the copyright reform. Um, we're seeing new drafts, um, new proposals in about um, three months rhythms currently and I guess that's, that will be going on for quite a while. We have elections coming up um, not too far away so um, that's going to be interesting. The second piece, and that's um, probably will shake up the music industry as well, is um, a decision by the Supreme Court on collective rights management about how to distribute royalties. Um, the background is, is um, very typical. You have a disgruntled um, legal author that sues the collecting society that administers um, rights and claims in his literary works and says, I'm not really happy that you distribute um, a share of the royalties that you collect to the publisher because um, I don't think they ever had a stake in these um, rights and claims anyway. And um, the courts looked at this, um, Munich courts and uh, Munich courts and then the Supreme Court, and they said, yes, you're actually right. In our German Copyright Act, um, a publisher and it doesn't matter whether it's a music publisher or a traditional book publisher, you don't have an original rights position under copyright law. The author has, um, composers in the music industry they have, but not the publisher. And you cannot really distribute money to someone as a collecting society who had no original stake in that. And further, we don't see an agreement between, between you guys later on that said, yes, we'll distribute it this and that way. Um, and um, I mean, Gamer has surely made their minds up about this um, and has for a long time, but um, I feel there's um, a lot coming up um, in, this, in this area, especially when you think that um, retroactively up to 10 years, you can probably look into what was going on distribution-wise. Well, that's interesting because now it shows the pieces on the on the reform. <laughs> Probably was too early this morning when I I was shuffling the the, the decks together. 
The last one, and that is, um, that is purely on the creative side, really, but, but really interesting. Um, our constitutional court talked about hip hop last week, this week, and it's brilliant. Um, the, um, the parties to this proceeding are these guys, quite renowned Germans, the Kraftwerk guys, and they sued um, a German hip hop producer from the Frankfurt area, um, had his great days uh, when I was young in the 80s, um, 90s, and early 20s, uh, this person, Moses P. And they sued him over a two second um, drum beat sample that he used. And um, they've been litigation up to the, litigating up to the Supreme Court, down again, and now at, this, at, this, at the Constitutional Court. And um, the verdict is what you could typically expect from a Constitutional Court. It's, um, it's very basic. It tells you exactly what you cannot do. You cannot go about sampling in Germany as you've done for the last 40 years. And it gives you a whole array of ideas how you should probably look at it. But you have no idea, really, um, what you're going to do with these bits and pieces. Um, they said, we need to balance these basic rights of property in the recording and the artistic freedom. And it's not sufficient what the courts have until now found as a solution to, ban to, to, to um, balance these interests. You must look at all these bits and pieces here. Is there direct commercial competition between the old recording and the new recording? Um, which typically in hip hop is not really the case. Um, but then if you think more about it, where is this typically the case? You would probably look at one-to-one -one ripoffs um, if, if that was ever come into play really. Another aspect is how significant was the sample? Um, I mean, that gets you into all type of expert witness statements on <laughs> how, how, um, how much um, a sample impacts a new recording. Artistic and timely distance of the two, um, two productions, that is great as well. So I can, I can use a very old blues sample in a techno track, and that's perfectly OK. But um, if, it, if it gets closer together, timely and artistically, then probably we get into troubles. Um, Difficult, really, to assess. And then, and that's really, that's really an interesting one, commercial impact of the damage on the original rights holder. So if I've already earned lots of money with, um, with my recording, then I'm probably not harmed too much anymore, and it's OK to sample that? Quite an interesting proposition. Let's see what we lawyers and the courts make out of it in the next decade or 15 years. Um, I don't think I will be able to update next year on this because that's not how German courts work. It all takes time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Florian. It looks, looks like copyright's undergoing seismic shifts both on a national level and on an international level right across the globe. So it's interesting times for us copyright lawyers. Peter, you're next. And by the way, I forgot to say, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're shorter than we usually are, an hour and a half of this session, and questions, I'm not going to take questions during the session, but all my speakers are going to be staying on during the coffee break afterwards at 11.30, so if you have any questions, please do put them to the speakers during the coffee break. Thanks. Okay, Peter. Thank you. Good morning. Alexander asked uh, us, all of the speakers, to be very tight on schedule and to focus on what really matters in our country. Now, according to Donald Trump, I come from a failed state. <laughs> so I'm not sure whether I'll get the focus right <laughs> on the real hot and heavy items, but I'll do my best. One of the topics of this morning is the CMO directive. And when we talk about CMOs, a lot of debate is going on about transparency timely payments, etc. And the directive, we all know, set out, sets out many obligations for CMOs. But the directive also states that in order to ensure that CMOs can comply with all these obligations, users should provide relevant information 
on the rise, on the use, I'm sorry, of the rights. A good example of the difficult relationship between CMOs and users in the re is the recent litigation between Sabam and IDNT in Belgium. We all know uh, Sabam, the Belgian CMO for music rights, and IDNT organizes dance festivals set, such as Sensation and Tomorrowland. Here you see a picture of Tomorrowland. Each stage of the festival is designed in a different sort of fantasy genre. And here you can see, for example, the Book of Wisdom team, which was used for the main stage in 2012. And I shall now read a chapter from the Book of Wisdom by IDNT. And the title of the chapter will be revealed at the end of my contribution. This is just an ordinary trick to keep you all awake, <laughs> but also to avoid that Alexander will interrupt me when I'm running out of time. <laughs> There we go. For many years, Sabam and IDNT had discussions as to the fees to be paid for the music. The dispute already started in 2004, and in 2008, parties reached an agreement as to the rights to be paid for past events. For the future, IDNT agreed that it would hand over all relevant information that could be relevant for the calculation of the fees, such as figures with regard to the sales of tickets, playlists, etc. Parties also agreed that on future events, Tariff 2011 would apply. Tariff 2011 is a tariff that applies for music festivals in Belgium. Rights are being calculated digressively per scale on revenues up to 50,000. You pay, for example, 6% uh, on the next 50,000, uh, five and a half. And in the end, when the turnover is on top of 3 million two, you only pay 2.50. As from 2010, IDNT did no longer send the relevant information. So Sabam started to send reminders and said, please provide us with the information and confirm that you agree with our rates. But IDNT started to gain time and play games. IDNT said, yes, okay, okay, we will give you the information tomorrow. After all, that's the name of the land these people come from. <laughs> In 2013, Sabam went to court and asked for an injunction. And Sabam claimed that further events should be prohibited if IDNT would not agree with the rates. IDNT argued that it was practically impossible to provide playlists of all DG sets. During an edition of Tomorrowland, for example, more than 30,000 works are being played. IDNT said you cannot ask hundreds of DGs, hey, Mr. DG, give me your set. <laughs> DGs are superstars. Now, that's true, even God is a DG. And IDNT continued, DGs come and go. After the set, they jump in a tour bus, tour bus sorry, or even in a helicopter, and they go to the next set. Sometimes they are drunk. Some of them took a pill in a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Often they do not even know what they played. <laughs> and some DGs even refuse to share the information <laughs> because they consider that the composition of their set is that unique and original, and they're really afraid to be copied. So IDNT was quite creative in inventing a mashup of excuses. Apparently, they never heard of software such as DG Monitor. All of a sudden, these people seem to live in yesterday land. <laughs> <laughs> IDNT also invoked that tariff 2011 could no longer apply since Tomorrowland does not really qualify as a music festival. The organizers argued that they rather create a magic world of fairy tales and that music is only a part of the event. <laughs> Furthermore, it was the opinion of IDNT that Sabam abused its rights and its dominant position by imposing its tariffs. But the Court of Appeal did not agree with these arguments. The court judged that the that it must be possible for IDNT to provide Sabam with all information. The court said, okay, you agreed to provide this information in 2008, so why can't you do it today? Sabam did not abuse its rights, according to the court, and the court stressed that Sabam did communicate its tariffs to the Ministry of Economic Affairs and even amended them after they had some comments. Sabam applied these tariffs in the same manner to all organizers of similar events, and moreover, the tariffs are public and can be consulted by everybody, amongst others on the website, which is also an obligation under the directive. Sabam did not abuse its dominant position. The tariffs were considered to be reasonable, so the court granted the injunction. But Sabam also went to the commercial court and claimed damages. 
it appeared that there was a big discrepancy between the figures that were submitted by IDNT and the figures that were communicated in the press. Further to a descriptive seizure, an expert, which was who was nominated by the court, had a look at the books of IDNT, and the results of the audit were, to say the least, as spectacular as the event Tomorrowland is itself. <laughs> Let me show you some findings. You can see the a comparison of the number of entrants, the, as declared by IDNT. <laughs> And uh, the findings of the expert, and then you see the difference uh, express, expressed in a uh, percentage, and the same for the turnover. Sensation is another event uh, organized by uh, IDNT. As a defense, IDNT argued it acted in good faith. The discrepancies could be explained by material errors, miscalculations, mistakes, etc. The commercial court rejected these accuses, of course, and Saban was entitled to a provisional amount of approximately 650,000 euro. The court ruled that the attitude of IDNT was shocking. That's what you can read in the judgment. Since IDNT deliberately communicated false figures and even refused to communicate any figures with regard to recent events. The court considered that the attitude of IDNT was to be qualified even as pure and clear deception. Because IDNT was acting in bad faith and was knowingly committing its infringing activities, IDNT was condemned to pay its benefits with regard to the past events to Saban. After the judgment, parties started to negotiate and reached an agreement. Meanwhile, IDNT developed Tomorrowland Brazil and started a spin-off in the US, where the festival is called Tomorrow World, Tomorrow land was not uh, available since the name Tomorrowland belongs to Mickey Mouse. <laughs> so Tomorrowland is doing well, and this brings me to the end of my speech and the moment to reveal the title of the chapter of the Book of Wisdom by IDNT. The title was How to Get a Free Loan to Expand Your Business. <laughs> I hope my focus was right, but now I think I better run. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Fabulous, as always. Um, right, that's uh, from that magic moment. Let's move swiftly on. John, tell us what's been going on in the Far East, please. And we're running a few minutes over time, but... Oh, no pressure, then. No pressure. Um, well, according to the concise Oxford Dictionary, to filibuster is to obstruct in a legislative assembly by a prolonged speaking. Well, the Hong Kong government is by now all too familiar with this term and tactic, which has been employed with great success by opposition members on a number of government initiatives, including one of the most recent being the passage of a new copyright bill. This bill provoked great concern amongst a significant portion of Hong Kong's population and a measure of demonstration that would not generally be associated with the passage of a copyright law. If I can roll the... No, that's not the audiovisual. <laughs> it's the audiovisual clip. Anyway, um, so what was all the fuss about? Well, on the face of it, not very much. Um, the bill included a broader right that allowed copyright owners to control dealings in their works across any electronic platforms, broadly defined in order to cover any existing or future modes of electronic, electronic transmission. There were also safe harbor provisions for DSPs, which the government had actually first tried to introduce in 2011 with the usual tote down notice mechanisms that exist elsewhere in the world. But where the angst seemed to be focused was um, around the attempt to expand upon the fair dealing exceptions. Hong Kong has had relatively limited fair dealing exceptions covering research and private studies, criticism review and news reporting, education and public administration. Three new additional fair uses were proposed, used for the purpose of parody, satire, caricature and pastiche used for the purpose of commenting on current events, and use of a quotation to the extent which is no more than necessary for its specific intended purpose. But while these additional fair uses um, certainly afforded better protection than the current regime, it was argued vociferously by some interest groups that the scope was not broad enough to cover all common derivative works. In an attempt to stall the debate and the passage of the bill, the pan-democrat lawmakers 
put forward approximately 1,300 amendments and requested a quorum bill triggering headcount no less than 24 times. These actions forced the government to withdraw the bill, which can now not be retabled until the 2017 legislative session. So what was the fuss really about? Well, Hong Kong people um, frequently use ironic pictures to express their opinions on public affairs, or even messages satirizing the chief executive and the Hong Kong government. Um, if we can now put up the PowerPoint. I'll just give you some examples to uh, take a look at. <laughs> There have been a number of incidents since the handover of 1997 involving public officials um, which have caused to seriously undermine the trust of some members of the public in the government. So I think at its root, um, the concern of some members of the public seems to be that now in a much more tense political landscape, um, after the incorporation of the fair dealing exemptions, um, there may be a greater likelihood that users would be prosecuted for political reasons. Meanwhile, over the border in the motherland, central government have made a number of policy announcements of significance to the entertainment industry, and specifically the music industry. The state administration of press, publication, radio, film, and television, more commonly known by its previous acronym, SAFT, published in November 2015 several opinions on vigorously promoting the development of China's music industry. The opinions propose a five-year plan to boost the value of the music industry to 300 billion RMB by the end of 2020. In order to reach this target, the opinions propose a number of measures, including cultivating large-scale music groups, establishing a large-scale professional music platform, and encouraging international cooperation. Midem will be um, pleased to hear that the opinions specifically mention Quote, to support PRC music corporations in participating in high-end exhibitions such as MEDEM. In terms of achieving these ends, the industry would seem to have made a good start. Kugu and Tencent QQ Music are China's largest music streaming services, both claiming more than 800 million registered users. Other major players include NetEase, um, Baidu Music, and the Alibaba Group owns um, brands Xiaomi and Tiantian Dongting. Apple Music is in the country, but is dwarfed by the indigenous players. Tencent's made great strides in licensing content from international rights owners, signing up Warner Music and Sony Music to exclusive distribution deals. It also owns the most popular instant messaging app, WeChat, by which users can share songs on Tencent's QQ Music platform. The QQ Music service claims over 100 million daily active users. Meanwhile, Baidu, operator of China's largest online search engine, has plans to merge with the domestic mu music company Taihe Entertainment Group. The deal will combine Baidu, Baidu Music and Taihe's traditional music publishing and artist development into a new digital music initiative. The partnership will see Taihe's intellectual property and IAR capabilities, covering more than 700,000 recordings, join with Baidu's streaming and distribution resources. Baidu has about 150 million active monthly users. In April 2016, um, Alibaba Music upgraded its music streaming service with the debut of an online platform whereby fans can connect with stars, merchants, and others in the entertainment industry. Music fans can use their smart smartphones to follow their favorite stars, participate in fan activities, purchase related merchandise, and watch live TV shows of cyber celebrities and popular singers. The division has exclusive rights agreements with numerous Chinese and Western labels, including Universal Music, BMG, SM Entertainment, and Rock Records. On the anti-piracy front, in November 2015, the General Office of State Council published its opinions on strengthening the governance of infringement and counterfeiting on the internet. The opinions introduce a three-year target for the suppression of IP infringement activities on the internet, Law enforcement agencies will focus on counterfeit products and internet piracy. However, they will also extend their monitoring coverage to include new transmission methods, such as third-party apps, cloud storage, Weibo, and WeChat. Furthermore, in January 2015, around 30 music companies and platforms in China launched the Online Music Copyright Association in an attempt to battle online piracy. The association published two documents, the Anti-Piracy Declaration, and the self-discipline.
Convention. As a general observation, having cited these policy initiatives, 2015 was a major year for copyright enforcement in the online music space. There were 687 cases tried at various Chinese courts, making it the largest category of online IP disputes. So finally, um, when is an iPhone not an iPhone? Well, if I can get it up. When it's a bag in China. In May 2016, the Beijing Municipal High Court ruled in favor of Shangtong Tian Technology, who had registered the iPhone trademark for leather goods. The major reason behind the court's decision was that Shangtong Tandi's use of the iPhone trademark would not harm Apple's interests, as no one in China would, would be confused and think that the leather goods were associated with Apple. Further, it held that Apple had failed to prove that the brand iPhone was famous in China. <laughs> Compare and contrast Apple's experience with that of Facebook. In May 2016, the same Beijing High Court ruled that Zhongshan Pearl River Drinks Factory, ZPR, should not have been allowed to register the Facebook trademark in association with its food and drinks products. The Beijing court said that ZPR's application to register Facebook was a blatant act of copying and harmed fair market competition. The application was in violation of public order and moral principles and that Facebook was intentionally copied from another high-profile trademark. Interestingly, iPhone sold over three million handsets in one weekend in China when it launched its iPhone 6, whereas Facebook is effectively banned in China. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, um, we, I think we, just, we just forget the numbers in China just have an extra three zeros after them, don't they, in terms of, of user base. It is extraordinary. Right, um, if I could ask you gentlemen to leave the platform, and if I ask Tim and Graham and David to join us. Ted, if you stay with us. And, um, yep, okay, thank you. Um, and Tim, if you'd like to sure. take the platform and give us a view of what's been happening in the United States. So I'd like to focus on just um, maybe three th main issues here, three main sort of uh, copyright developments. One would be the copyright reform that is perhaps not a little formless. Um, the other is a review of the consent decrees by the Department of Justice. Those are the consent decrees that govern how ASCAP and BMI run their businesses and they handle um, handle their relations with the DSPs. And then finally, I'd like to just briefly touch on the settlement with Spotify that was negotiated by the NMPA that a lot of people are, have been discussing. It's raised some controversy in, uh, Sorry. or some, some, I'm not sure, controversy, some heated discussion among the various stakeholders in the United States as to what, in, what it means. Uh, so I'd just like to talk about the general structure of that to the extent that it's public knowledge. So copyright reform, uh, the, the House Judiciary Committee oversees uh, copyright in the United States. So uh, Chairman Goodlatte the, the, uh, of the Judiciary Committee announced that he was going to be reviewing, uh, doing an overhaul, over, overview, review of the Copyright Office and announced a, a number of hearings and also requested the Copyright Office uh, perform its own study, and the Copyright Office uh, undertook a, a large number of roundtables. Uh, they solicited stakeholders, they went around the country, they went from Nashville to New York to Los Angeles uh, on a variety of issues that were related to what seemed to be a very broad reassessment of copyrights uh, status in a, in a very changing world. So um, they had roundtables on the possibility, for example, of a small claims court where copyright holders could uh, get redress for infringement online without having to uh, go to federal court, in fact, which is prohibitively expensive for most people that are vi whose rights are being violated when you think it's perhaps a, a photographer whose works have been reproduced on a website or uh, some of these smaller stakeholders, smaller content owners, 
um, wanting to have some redress. So that was, there was a whole series of discussions on that topic alone. There was a top, there was a, uh, more in-depth roundtables on music licensing in general, as you all may know, uh, that culminated in a report by the Copyright Office that was over 200 pages. Uh, generally speaking, uh, you won't have to read it. Uh, I didn't, it wasn't assigned reading for this. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, I would say the, the uh, recommendations focused on fair compensation to creators, encouraged a more efficient licensing process, including the availability of a public database, and again, bringing up the suggestion of, of perhaps blanket licensing and mechanical licensing being managed by a central, uh, central organization, uh, making that mandatory in the way that we saw with the uh, Section 115 reform uh, legislation that was introduced but, not, uh, but then died uh, in 2006. Uh, the report also generally um, focused on less, uh, less restrictive uh, government oversight of, of licensing in general. As, as you all may know, music publishing income, and I'm focusing on this from a music publisher's perspective, but I think uh, most of the content owners um, share similar concerns. The uh, three quarters of the songwriter's income, three quarters of publishing income is under some form of government regulation, whether it's the consent decrees uh, that govern public performance income or it's the mechanical, compulsory mechanical license where the rates are set, uh, in fact, by the government. So there was a lot of discussion. The report was highly, uh, highly anticipated. It was very uh, long. <laughs> But uh, the question is now, what's going to happen? The Judiciary Committees continue. Uh, the Copyright Office roundtables continue. But the Chairman Goodlatte's tenure is going to be up in next year, and it's considered likely that some sort of so form of legislation is going to be introduced. But I think he's made it clear that it's only going to be on issues where there's consensus, and that, as you all know, consensus among the various stakeholders, even within uh, the content owners, much less between content owners and content users, is a, a, pretty, a pretty difficult uh, thing to achieve. So what I, it seems most likely is when you have legislation introduced, it's probably going to be on copyright office structuring. There's the Code Act, which is currently uh, under discussion, just basically how the Copyright Office works, what its duties are, who it answers it to. I think it's most likely that it's really in those administrative areas it will see any movement in the next year. Uh, so a lot of noise, a lot of hearings, but probably you're not going to see anything that looks like copyright reform in the next year. Um, so moving on to the consent decree review. Um, this is what I think most eyes are on in the States because it's just simply so bizarre a story uh, and it's also um, so uh, uncertain as to what the results of this review are going to be. Just to give you a little bit of background, the public performance organizations, ASCAP and BMI, are under Department of Justice antitrust consent decrees. They've been operating since the 1940s. Um, those decrees limit uh, and restrict how ASCAP and BMI can negotiate with third parties, uh, licensees for, uh, for licenses for the, their catalogs. So um, it's long been held by the content owners that those limitations imposed by the consent decrees result in below market rates for the public performance of copyrighted musical works. Um, and I think we have a lot of comparative uh, examples throughout the world that show that this is the case. Um, there have been pressure to review the consent decrees, particularly when um, major publishers withdrew their digital rights a couple of years ago uh, in order to pursue independent market negotiations with the major DSPs. That's allowed under the consent decrees, they thought. Um, direct negotiations. Well, it turns out that the, the courts overseeing the consent decrees ruled that, no, in fact, you can't partially withdraw. You have to be entirely out or entirely in. Um, finally, the, the PROs requested the Department of Justice to review and, if necessary, to make changes 
to the consent decrees to allow more flexibility and to uh, allow some of the, those content owners that wanted to get out from under the thumb of, uh, of restrictive, uh, uh, restrictive rates uh, that are artificially depressed. Um, so the, consent, the Department of Justice undertook, began a review. Stakeholders submitted their comments, and then about a year into the review, they issued a, a peculiar question to the stakeholders saying, can you please uh, give us your thoughts on why we shouldn't consider the consent decrees to require 100% licensing by the PROs? And what that means, I'm, many of you will be familiar with that, it's a peculiar American structure of the Copyright Office whereby one co-owner of a copyright can license the entire work. It's a, principle of joint tenancy that we borrowed from uh, English law, unfortunately, I think, uh, <laughs> in terms of copyright. Many other aspects of English law are working quite well in the United <laughs> States. Um, so this was a, a, an odd and unsettling uh, request because if in fact they feel that ASCAP and BMI are required by the consent decrees to license 100% of their repertoire, and not only the repertoire of their respective members and publisher members, but they have to give the right to a DSP to play the entire repertoire. Well, that will upend the entire uh, current status quo because that's not how it's licensed. It's not the kind of licenses that ASCAP and BMI have felt that they have given. It's not the kind of licenses that the licensees have felt that they have received historically. And the implications are, uh, it, it's, it's sort of staggering to think how this would, how this would work in practice. Uh, Co-writers would no longer have the ability to, uh, co-writers would, would be would would be required to license in their entire works when they grant them to the PRO. So for example, if I'm an ASCAP writer, I'm writing with a BMI writer, uh, one of us is gonna license the entire song and the other one isn't. And those agreements, any agreements that we might have had between us as to not licensing 100% of the work are, I guess, void, I suppose, if the, if the Department of Justice's view uh, what it seemed to suggest its view was prevailed. Um, most recently, it, it appears that some sort of uh, ruling is going to be imminent, perhaps in the next few weeks, and the stakeholders uh, on the content side are not optimistic. We do believe there will be some form of 100% licensing involved in, in the DOJ's ruling. And what that means is they may, whether or not that then has to go to a court to be d determined or approved by the Second Circuit depends on whether or not the Department of Justice feels they're just interpreting the existing decree or if uh, they believe any sort of changes changes required. ASCAP and BMI may perhaps uh, appeal uh, to the Second uh, Circuit, the courts that oversee the consent decrees, if that's the case, but. We're not optimistic. We anticipate some turbulence. And I think for those of you with, uh, involved in the foreign societies, it's going to be particularly concerning because uh, that leaves the question of foreign writers who have not granted 100% licensing rights to their societies. It's not, it's not a part of foreign law. It's only in the United States. Uh, what's, the role of, what is, what's the role of their rights in the United States under this scheme under, uh, in which 100% licensing is, is considered required in public performance. Um, so it's definitely something to watch. Uh, I, it's really uncertain as to uh, how, the, how the market will respond to that. Um, Tim, if I could ask you to rattle through the last final points sure, I'll just go so that we the, don't run out of total time. The last thing great. I want to just mention is the Spotify settlement. It's, uh, I'm going to mention basically what I think is public knowledge. Spotify had, a, a, as everyone knew, Spotify and the major DSPs had an enormous amount of pending and unmatched funds. And uh, the NMPA entered into a negotiation, market-wide, industry-wide negotiation with them to, uh, to figure out a way to liquidate those funds. And, uh, and the interesting part about the settlement is uh, it, it maybe provides a roadmap for other digital service providers that are sitting on enormous amounts of uh, unmatched funds from mismatches, from songs that weren't identified. So the basic structure 
of the settlement from what is uh, generally been uh, made known is that there's a release for past liability. The amount of, uh, there will be um, a data exchange between publishers and Spotify, those participating. Uh, there will be a portal under which unmatched songs, unmatched works can be claimed by the publishers. And then you, can, you should be able to go in yourself and uh, I try to identify your works and then the residual amount will be uh, allocated based on market share, it, it seems. So the, the final residual will be paid out and this process will happen repeatedly. There'll be after each uh, accounting, there'll be a three month period claiming unclaimed works and then the final amount after that will be allocated based on market share to provide full liquidation of, of amounts for uh, Spotify. Watch for this in future settlements that will occur because, as I said, many of the DSPs uh, are sitting on similar large amounts of funds and uh, I imagine this structure will be replicated in the future with DSPs as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. <laughs> Sounds like could be a, a solution to the eternal problem of the black box. Uh, right, David, if you'd like to tell us about the direct... Yes, if you feel, free, feel free to stay there. Okay, so you asked me about the impact of the CRM directive for SASEM. Uh, first of all, in France, uh, the CRM directive has not been transposed yet. It will be done through a specific decree that implies that there will be no discussion in front of a French parliament, and at the very end, uh, the French parliament will ratify this decree. So this is a good point for us because we are afraid about the discussion, a political discussion of the way of the functioning of a copyright collecting societies. And I think the whole process will be ended uh, at the end of the year. So we could expect a draft from uh, the transposition at the end of this month. We all know that the CRM directive provided different set of rules. The first set of rules are related to the relationship with members. And uh, the goal uh, from this directive is to give more flexibility uh, between the CMO and the members. Uh, regarding SASEM, I would say that the flexibility is already in place. We have 12 categories of right, which is one of the principles set up by the directive. Uh, we have exclusive assignment of rights. That implies that if you opt for SASEM in order to manage your right, it is on an exclusive assignment. And the good thing is that the CRM directive does not jeopardize the possibility to give an exclusive assignment of right. And I that's an assignment of both the communication to the public yes, and the mechanical right. Absolutely. And from the authors, not directly from the publisher. So when you're an author, even if you have a publishing deal, you give an, an exclusive assignment to SASEM, which manage the rights that it is on, uh, uh, that it could manage. And you, we have 12 categories. We have, of course, s the option from online categories. We make a distinction between interactive online and linear online communication. And according to the directive, last year we modified our bylaws in order to enable monoterritorial online exploitation and multi-territorial online exploitation because you have in the CRM directive two main articles which are very key for us, article 30 and 31, which create a tag on obligation, and I will uh, come later on the tag on obligation. The second set of rules are related to governance. You see that there is a strong harmonization uh, the way uh, about the governance of uh, different CMOs in Europe. And I think the main idea brought by the directive is to create a supervisory function. Uh, we don't have up to now a supervisory function, and we will create a supervisory board. So you will have a board of administrators and a supervisory board, which is supposed to control the boards of directors. It's gonna be very complex, but that's life. And I don't think it is a huge problem for us in the way we're making business. Um, another set of rules which are very interesting is transparency. Transparency, it's a key principle uh, within this directive. 
transparency to our members. We have to give more information, and I think it is a very good thing because we are already provided effective tool in order to be more transparent. Transparency also towards our sister societies, which is very key because you know that the way the CMOs are functioning through a network of mandate between societies. So it is important for our sister society to get the relevant information from us, but also for us to obtain relevant information from our sister societies. And sometimes, believe me, it's very complex. Th those reciprocal agreements at the moment are confidential. Um, do you see them as being made public, do you think? Yes. It's not so confidential. You know, they, they, they are built on the, on the, on the CSAC, CSAC quite model. Cr cr model. Okay. So it's, it's a mandate, okay? You should manage our rights in your territory, mm. which does not work for online users, mm. which is completely different. All the licensing prof process for online users is uh, carried on outside the scope of uh, traditional networks for collection societies. So transparency towards members, towards our sister society, and also towards users. But the problem for me is that we also want and expect a certain degree of transparency from the users. And someone before talked about the SABAM case and the difficulty met by SABAM to obtain the relevant information in order to distribute the money. It's not only about to collect money. We need the relevant information to distribute the money. And we face, unfortunately, very strong difficulties. And not only in the traditional uh, way uh, uh, of collection. The most important difficulties we have is with certain online actors. Mm. For instance, a company which starts with a Y and ends with an E, which is a major uh, uh, UGC platform, believe me, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare to work with those guys. And we need to obtain, in our transposition, uh, provision which enables to obtain more transparency, more accuracy of the data. It's key for the online market, and especially since we deal with in a world which is very complex. We have split co copyright, we have fragmentation of rights, uh, we are dealing on a pan european basis or on a worldwide basis, so it is a crucial point for us. As you all know, there is also a Title III, which is exclusively dedicated to copyright uh, uh, collection society in the musical field. Uh, for instance, in France, SASEM, which is the only uh, CMO which collects on behalf of author, composer, and publisher for works in the musical field. Uh, does this title free change a lot of things for us? Frankly, not so, not so much. Why? Because, as you all know, we had a recommendation from the Commission in 2005 which enabled certain type of right holders to opt for a CMO in order to give a uh, license on a pan-European basis. Mm -hmm. And things was done previously the directive, since the major publisher uh, opted for different CMOs. And for instance, uh, concerning SASEM, we have a very strong partnership with Universal Music Publishing and also with Wixen. And uh, all the major publishers uh, withdrew their online rights and give such rights to one CMO in Europe in order to collect on a pan-European pan basis. So it's already into place, if I may say so, and we already adapted ourselves in order to give such a license. There is, uh, however, something new, is the tag on obligation. We all know that this directive has created, in a certain manner, two kinds of copyright societies. Societies which are able to provide pan-European license through what we call option-free publishers, and other societies which only connect on a mono-territorial basis in their country or only for their local repertoire. And Title III set up a different kind of criteria which enable society, we want to make pan-European deal. And if your company, if you're a society which you're not in position to provide a pan-European license, you could ask for another CMOs to do the job. And the new obligation 
created by the directive is an obligation for a pan-European CMO to agree to accept the mandate given by the small societies. So this is, the, in my opinion, the really new important rules adopted and provided by the directive. We will see what will happen and I think the best way to proceed regarding this issue is maybe to create a hub. It's what we have done through Harmonia, for instance. Harmonia is a bunch of uh, CMOs who try to work together, to license together, and uh, to process the data, to invoice, and uh, in order to facilitate the life of DSP, which act on a pan-European basis. And uh, you also have ICE mm -hmm. on the other side with PRS, Gamma, and STEAM, and Harmonia has, I think, seven uh, CMOs. SASEMS, Guy, the Italian, the Austrian, Belgium, and uh, I hope that I don't uh, forget one of them. <laughs> so the online right, I think the landscape regarding the online right is already not written into stone, but very well uh, structured, and we try to streamline the process of online right. I think the situation is very different from the US since you, don't have non, you have non-exclusive assignments. Publisher could not, if I understood correctly, withdraw certain rights, and uh, you have PRO in the US, which is also very different, because in Europe, in continental Europe, for instance, uh, the collecting society administer both mechanical and communication to the public. So we could issue bundles of rights, which is, I think, a, a key issue. And then, at the very end, you we have uh, the directive provided with what we call enforcement measures. What are these enforcement measures? On one side, you have dispute resolution procedure towards members, between societies, and between CMOs and users. I think the good thing uh, regarding this directive is that there is no obligation of tribu copyright tribunal. In France, we fight and we're still fighting fiercely against any tribunal, copyright tribunal, because we all know that it's less than the remuneration. It's a nightmare for the CMOs. So there is a faculty, but not an obligation. And uh, the other uh, important aspect is the monitoring authority, because the directive has implemented an obligation which enables the states to provide an authority which is supposed to monitor all the activities of CMOs. It's already in place in France. It has been adopted uh, 10 years or 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. We work with the authority. It's like an old couple. Sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it goes well, but we're, we're used to it. Mm -hmm. And it is true that uh, the directive will provide a new provision for the authority in order to monitor us, but I, f I, don't, I don't see it as a huge problem for us. Uh, we agreed to be monitored. Also, it's a, it's a proof uh, towards anybody, and especially to our members, that we act effectively. So I don't see that. It's not a big concern for me. And uh, there is no tribunal, co copyright tribunal. I think it, is, it was key for us. So we will see how it will uh, uh, organize things. There was also different uh, interesting rules, non-commercial use, you know, that the directive provide a specific provision <coughs> which enable uh, our members to, uh, to deal, to, to have a license for non-commercial use. We already put that in place because uh, we set up uh, three years ago an agreement with the Creative Commons which enable our members for non-commercial use only uh, to, to make deal through the Creative Commons system. So for, for us, it's not a huge problem. It could be a problem for certain CMOs, mm -hmm. which do not have such uh, procedures. But monitoring and enforcement measure, I think we could live with, uh, with that. Uh, in conclusion, I would say that uh, fragmentation is part of our life. Yeah. It will uh, uh, increase the competition between CMOs, but it's also an opportunity for us. 
an opportunity to connect on a pan-European basis, on a worldwide basis. For instance, we have uh, deals with a certain DSP which covers more than 100 countries. And uh, we will see what happens in the US, because I think the process will be the same. Uh, there will be a fragmentation of certain rights, and maybe for PROs, the capacity to also administer uh, reproduction rights. That will increase the fragmentation, and that we know that uh, the main aspect of the fragmentation is the Anglo-American repertoire, yeah. because which is the only repertoire which travels so well. Mm -hmm. So there will be a fierce competition between uh, CMOs regarding this repertoire. So we will see what happens. Okay. We're ready for it. We have option-free deals with Universal, with Vixen. We also created a hub. We should expand, in my opinion, uh, the way the hub are functioning. It's a process. It's, it's a, a process in progress, if I may say so. So interesting. A lot of work to do regarding the implementation, and uh, we hope that we will avoid the worst. Okay, Thank David. You. Thank you very much for that very clear description. Um, and I think. There's obviously a lot of work to do among societies, and I know SASM and PRS certainly are well ahead of the game, and no doubt Gamer and some of the other smaller societies have yet to catch up. Let's, in the closing minutes, return to that, um, that important question of the value gap. And we've heard from Ted that, certainly in Europe, there doesn't seem to be any appetite to change the e-commerce directive, the horizontal safe harbor, if you like, but that we will be seeing copyright changes which may serve to close it up in some sense. Graham, perhaps you'd like to tell us about what the position is likely to be in the United States and Canada, i.e. North America in general. Um, I think I'm going to have to use this. I don't have a... Thank you. Um, I, I'm actually going to just, I think, start and um, bring, try, try to give some uh, uh, foundation to the problem. Um, and I'll, I'll start by stating the obvious that streaming is the future of the music business. Um, we all know that. Um, however, not all streaming services are created equally uh, from the perspective of the uh, creator and uh, those who invest in them. And very obviously, there's a difference between subscription type services and ad supported services. Now, last year, um, we had an uptick in, uh, in the music business of about 3.2%, which is something uh, to be applauded. It's driven uh, by streaming. However, we have to remember that uh, we're starting back from a base where we've lost almost 50% of the market. Um, a couple of statistics which stand out and have been alluded to earlier. Um, in terms of comparing subscription to uh, ad support, uh, 68 million subscribers to, uh, to subscription services uh, return about uh, 28 billion US dollars. So 68 million return 28 billion. In terms of ad supported, about 960 million. So over 10 times as many return 634 million. That's almost nothing. Um, a user of a subscription service returns $18 per user. Ad supported, and we're talking about YouTube here, $1 per user. These are astonishing numbers. Um, the uh, UK statistic was mentioned earlier. It has to do with ad-supported video services, which are up uh, by an extraordinary amount. I think it's about 88%, uh, uh, but the revenue is up 0.4%. Uh, the vinyl numbers were mentioned as well. Uh, vinyl in the United States in comparison with all ad-supported services, uh, out-earn, out-return more revenue than all of the ad-supported services, vinyl. Um, now, I want to actually put this in terms of the artist, um, because I think what is clear now, and I'm actually stunned and shocked that it has taken this long uh, for policymakers, well, maybe for even ourselves to realize this, that artists are worse off today than they were in 1999. Uh, and that was not the promise. Uh, intermediaries, uh, technophiles, media, everybody promised that whatever happened, the, intermedi the, the old heritage labels, whatever, they might disappear, but that artists were going to enter a golden age and they were going to be better off. 
and we're about 20 years into this, and they're very clearly worse off. And they're worse off because policymakers over a period of 20 years created a system, and, and the safe harbor is one of them, created a system of cross-subsidies. Safe harbor sounds so anodyne, exceptions is a word that sounds so bloodless. But every time you create an exception like that, you are saying that people who would otherwise have been paid are not going to be paid, and that the money is going to stay in the pockets of somebody else. And safe harbors such as the one that were created in 1999 were created in the, in the dial-up era when Google was not even a glimmer in anybody's mind. And we live with that today. And what it's created uh, is a literal monster where the artistic middle class has been wiped out and where the concentration of wealth that we see in many different areas of our economy is acute. Fewer and fewer artists, fewer and fewer labels have more money leaving everybody else with almost nothing. And if you look at the sort of what, what that world looks like, it, it looks like a hobby. Uh, and why Francis Moore says that this is an issue for legislators uh, is because the policymakers are the ones who created those exceptions, who created those cross subsidies that are enriching trillionaires and billionaires at the expense of creators. So what are the prospects for amending, amending the safe harbor to section 512 in the United States um, and the equi equivalent of Canada? What is the appetite there at uh, well, I, I would government level? Just very quickly in Canada, I don't think there's a particular appetite. We've got a brand new government. Uh, I don't think they're particularly interested in tinkering with copyright. Mm. But in any event, it doesn't matter, mm. I don't think, what Canada does or doesn't think. It matters what <laughs> the EU thinks and it matters what the United States thinks because right. that's where those deals get made. Tim, what are your views on that? Well, discussions have only just begun on the DMCA in the United, DMCA in the United States, but there's strong discussions. But again, that was, that's the Copyright Office. It's not the legislature. So Copyright Office can make its recommendations, but not that won't necessarily translate to action. Mm -hmm. More likely, you're going to see uh, the pressure on the, at the CRB, the mechanical rate proceedings. That's where we're going to try to push the rates up. But it, it probably wouldn't have the effect of, of uh, re reforming the DMCA. So we're stuck with a safe harbor in North America. For As now. it is. For now. Okay. For now. Ted, do you want to just describe again what you feel is the likely, if we're not going to see a change to the e-commerce directive safe harbor, the uh, particular focused copyright reform that may alter that harbor for copyright works? Okay. Well, as I understand it, um, and I think it was explained very well um, by Graham, the problem is the safe harbor. Uh, and so normally, you would well, fix the safe harbor. Or I like, the Germans call them privileges, coming back to a, a more appropriate term. Normally, you would fix the privilege by making it clear that certain platforms don't get to live in that, in that safe harbor or, or have that privilege. However, from a political point of view, um, changing Article 14 of the e-commerce directive seems unlikely. There's not much appetite for it. And... Um, Blocking legislation that's going to hurt you, particularly in the United States, is very easy to do. In Europe, it's a little bit harder because of the right of initiative, but it can be done. And remember, we're talking about trillionaires. So the focus has been to look at merely copyright. Remember, the e-commerce directive is horizontal, so it deals with all kinds of illegality online. Is to been focus on saying that these platforms communicate to the public by doing things like promoting modifying, uh, selecting, aggregating, to look at those different things that they do um, and say that's making available. If you do that and you clarify that they're making available, you may still have a problem with the safe harbor though. Mm. So um, some have posited that you would put some kind of a link in the copyright directive and refer to Article 14. All of this is going to be very difficult to actually do in practice. I would say fix Article 14 and leave the making available right alone. I don't know if that's going to work. I mean, you know, it's not just a safe harbor. 
Uh, it's not just a safe harbor. I mean, that's, a, that's obviously a key component of it. In Canada, there must be at least a dozen exceptions that have been created yeah. that are diverting hundreds of millions of dollars away from songwriters and recording artists and the people that invest in them. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, there's, there, there are obviously legal and legislative responses. They take years. The bigger issue to me is where fairness is going to come into this. Why certain entities cannot negotiate fairly, why they have to hide behind uh, antique uh, legal uh, exceptions or privileges, why are they hiding um, when there is a scandalous amount of money uh, in that pot. Um, so I think I think y y we, we need that. I, I just think also too that the, the argument that, or, or what we get to say to the policymakers is, did you plan this? Did you plan a world mm -hmm. where creators as a class have been disadvantaged and the middle class has been wiped out? Did you plan that? Because if you planned that, and of course the response is gonna be, good God, we didn't plan it. Well then do something about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess we uh, don't expect any changes in the immediate... Uh, uh, David, yes. Uh, yes, I would like to add one important thing uh, regarding the European situation. Article 14 is a key issue, of course. You know, when the e-commerce directive was adopted, it was adopted uh, in coordination uh, with the copyright directive. Mm -hmm. And those two texts were supposed to coexist peacefully. And then we had a very broad interpretation by the court of Article 14, which is related to us provider, and the problem came. And I think we should solve the problem through the copyright directive. It's more easy to do so because we have a copyright problemacy to deal with. And we don't want to deal with other problemacy, which could be related to Article 14. But I think our concerns are twofold. You have, of course, the role of a digital platform, but you, are, you also need, as all the lawyers need, a clarification. And a clarification regarding the communication to the public acts. We don't know what is a public today in Europe. We don't know who is responsible for an act of communication. We don't know when the two entities are involved, uh, uploaders and a platform. Who is responsible for an act of communication to the public, which is a real problem for us. We don't know when we have broadcaster, cable operator who works together, who is responsible for an act of communication. We don't know with subsequent act of communication who is responsible. Hyperlinking issue is also a very important matter for us. So we need urgently, and this has to be done through the copyright directive, some change, some clarification. We could not, as lawyers, leave uh, with the interpretation from the European Court of Justice, which is in complete contradiction. One day you have a ruling which uh, agreed on a principle of a joint liability, and the other day, two, two years after, they say, no, there's no joint liability, there is an alternative liability. It's impossible for us to make business, it's impossible for lawyers to predict what will be the next ruling. So, this is a political question. Now the Commission should took its responsibility to provide with set of rules which are clear. They are doing in every field. They have to do also on copyright. It is key for us. Mm. It's a very good point, and as we all know, we await every single new decision of the European <laughs> yeah. Court on communication to the public and with no bated appeal. breath, don't we? There's no appeal. You have there's an interpretation no by the European Court of Justice, and sometimes you don't even understand what we are mm. supposed to do, supposed to mean, and what you are you going to do. So there is a political responsibility from the states, and you see that the French government is very involved mm -hmm. in the clarification and to fight of the abuse of safe harbor, because we're not against safe harbor. Safe harbor should be applicable to mere host provider. I don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. The problem is YouTube. The problem is Daily Motion. Yeah. The problem is entities which act as music distributor, not act as host provider. Yeah. This is a political issue. This is not only a legal issue. So it's a political and a legal issue, and no doubt plenty of debate to come. And we've run out of time. Um, it's now coffee break time. So um, please do stay. Um, put your questions to the panel if you have them. Thank you all for being here. See you next year, except I won't be here in the chair.